So the way that this evening is going to work is we're going to have two halves. The first half is going to be all of our incredible speakers talking about an inspirational woman or a group of inspirational women uh, from their particular region that they're going to represent this evening. And then the second half, we will uh, show a short video about the Eat She campaign, and then we're going to have a discussion involving the rest of you guys about Eat She and whether we think it's a good idea or a bad idea, and some general thinking around it. So to kick us off, Malaka is going to speak briefly on women in education, I guess. Perfect. Uh, yeah, okay. um, so hi, everyone. Uh, first, my name is Malaka, and I'm the Indian Education Representative of Shakti. I've been asked to speak about my experience um, and how is like how is it related to education, what it means to be educated in Gaza. So um, I lived most of my life in, in Gaza, which is um, a place to the east south of my time. Um, and it's like a really small area, like 360 square kilometer with around one like one point eight million um basically living there, so it's like a very populated populated area. Um, since I was born, my my parents like used to tell me uh, a lot about education, how education is important. Um, I remember my um, like my, my parents um, like told me once that education is resistance, and like this word resistance like has a lot of meaning. Um, so like you can resist by education, you can resist by being educated, and raising like know how to raise, how to raise awareness about, about a specific issue. So this is this is resistance um, and uh, about it. Um, so like I finished my um, my school and then um, go to university. Um, like ten years ago, you would not find um, a lot of students, like a lot of women students, specifically in in girls and boys, time going to schools. But nowadays, I think it has dramatically changed. Um, like looks. Like you will find, like in the university that I study in, this at the University of Gaza. Um, nowadays, there are like sixty percent of the university population are female students, uh, while the rest forty percent are like men. Um, so there is there is a tendency on uh, being educated and going to university, uh, like higher education system. Um, so I finished my undergrad at the University of Gaza. I did. Um, um, English literature and English education. After we finish, uh, my father like visited me, Malika, when will you like start your master? Like uh, start start finding something. And I was like really surprised because I thought at this time that like the community would not understand that I like as a student, as a female, can go and can go outside and alone and study and live like live alone for one or two years, like as as like as someone who lived in um, a society like and they um, they do appreciate that like women are like they can travel but they they have to get someone with them to travel with them so um, like my father was was the one who encouraged me to go and find a scholarship and travel along uh, I thought like looking into scholarship I got accepted into like some universities in the UK and outside. Um, and then I got a few women in Sheffield. Um, so the few women is about like um, thirteen thousand uh, pounds. But to travel, you have to get living expense as well. So you can't get your visa without having the living expense already, um, like already covered. Um, so I have to do something called a fundraising bid, where I got around sixty percent of um, the ten thousand pounds that are required to come to Sheffield. And I like contacted some some organization in Sheffield and outside uh, to help me with the rest. Um, after a few days, I got the whole amount of money. I applied for the visa and and I got the visa afterwards. Uh, now the other challenge was like how to get outside Gaza, which is like the most difficult bit in the whole journey. Um, so I went to the border in the first stop. Basically, in Gaza, you have two borders. One is to the north of Gaza and it's called Eris Border and it's run by the Israeli and we like we we don't feel like we we don't feel relaxed, like we don't like doing that because we will be interrogated, we will be questioned about about our neighbours or about our uncles or about our siblings and we don't want to answer. So 
so we don't feel like doing that. And after all, you will not travel anyway, so there's no there's no need doing that. So you go to the like the less west to west option, which is Rafa border, which is Rafa the Egyptian. And because of the unstable situation, unstable within the situation in Egypt um, nowadays. Like the situation in Rafah border, which is between us, like Gaza and, and Egypt, it's is it closed more than it's open. So um, I went there um, and I was refused on the first day. And the second day, we start protesting as students, like specifically female students, and we start like shouting and like let us study, let us travel. And after about two hours of protesting in the sun. Um, the, like one of the officer came to us and he started talking to us and saying like what do you want and we're like we want to travel like we don't want to lose our scholarship so after all they they agreed on getting 30 students travel in the second day so we're like that's fine that's better than having none of us travel uh, so they start calling me um, randomly and the 30th name was someone called Malak my name is Malaka, and I was like really surprised. Uh, like, is that my name or not? Um, but it was not my name. So Malak has not responded, and they called another name, which was my name, Malaka. So I was like really off at the moment. Like, I'm really happy that like this moment has come. But now, like more challenges has come, including that I need to travel alone inside my visit, which is like three hours traveling alone. And in a place where like no houses, like nothing is there, like you with the private, that's it. That was a challenge. Um, after all, I can do it. I start my study here. Um, I find Sheffield really welcoming. I like Sheffield. It's my it's like my second home. I like everyone here. Um, and then I was uh, nominated to be like one of the officers of the student. It was a difficult decision uh, because nearly. Um, I was here only for about six months, um, and I know like people who are running will will be here for about three, four years. They have lots of friends. I've just come, so it would be really difficult. But with the support of my friends and like all the supporters around, um, we got it afterwards. Uh, afterwards, um, I got around like three thousand, um, three thousand like four hundred votes, which is the highest in the history of Shibin University. Which, which is like more than 100 years, and I was like really excited and really surprised. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's all about women power, and it's all about um, what we can do if we have the willingness to do this thing. Um, yeah, I'm here now speaking to you, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much for that. That was awesome. If you'd like to get off to your next event, that would be fine. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Okay, the next speaker that we have this evening is Khadija, who doesn't really know that she's good at speaking, but I'm sure she'll have something amazing to say. And she's here to talk to us about women's role in Africa. Thank you. Well, women in Africa, inspiring women in Africa, what it's like being a woman in Africa, Africa and women. Go. Right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Khadija, I'm from Nigeria, which is um, in West Africa. So I didn't really plan for this, so I'm going to make it. Um, one one I don't know who's inspiring is the current minister of finance. Um, her name is Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala. She... Sorry, who did you hear? You can talk about Douglas and Moyo as well if you like. Douglas and Moyo, or I can talk about that. <laughs> well, she's the current minister of finance, and we thought that she um, she was the manager in um, World Bank. And vice president, sorry. she was the vice president of World Bank, and um, she led a struggle and reached out to Nigeria, where she was elected the first, um, where she was elected to be minister of finance. And during her tenure as a minister, she was able to. Um, get Nigeria off of um, the debt um, that they owed to lots of people. Um, and because of that, the, I think we kind of got better economically. So, um, and in October 2005, she, like I said, she did the whole debt relief stuff and this is really very important. Um, 
Should I ask you some questions instead? Yes. How about we do it like that? So, um, do you think that women in Africa are embarrassed? What do you think women's empowerment looks like in Africa? How does that compare with our experiences in the UK? It's very different. How? Well, okay. First of all, um, there's a world of as a woman, you struggle to get where you are, so and you have to prove yourself. Um, whatever it is you do, so in business, in science, in medicine, whatever, you have to prove that you're worthy of a man's respect. So you have to fight your way through all the time. But I think it's changing gradually, but it's changing. It's not a perfect to um, yeah. What about women's role in the family? What does that look like? Well, I was a working woman, and um, nowadays you find women who actually have jobs or businesses and do not stay at home, mm -hmm. cook, clean, and take care of the kids. How's that perceived by society? Uh, I'm not really sure. I think, like I said, change is very, very difficult back home. We don't like change, I think so like change, so it's it's going to take a while, but everyone's having to do it. What do you think could be done to make it better? Do you think you need something to come in as a catalyst and make change happen? Or do you think that in order for it to be sustainable, it has to happen the African way over a period of long time? Well, I think with um, women like, um, like the blue subdivides, the late um, president of the Economic and Financial Commission, with people like the other, I think the certain, the, the take it away from um, women and that is, I think that's not catalyst because when young women see them, see other women achieving what they um, achieving at the moment, I think that is an inspiration for everyone really. Do you think Nigeria is reflective of the wider African picture or do you think that the experience of women in Nigeria is very different to the rest of Africa? I guess um, I just wanted to make the point that Nigeria is one country in Africa and your experiences are not necessarily reflective of the whole of Africa. No, obviously not. Everyone, everyone's got different um, experiences. I think it's typical for countries. So. Of course. Yeah. But I think in the UK and in the West, we often stereotype Africa as being one place. It's and we're, not. And we're much African either. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're much better at not doing that with other countries, but we have a particular problem with talking about Africa as this other. And I think the reason I asked that question was to just underline the point that your experience in Nigeria is not reflective of the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for Kim? Please ask. This is the shot. Do any of our panelists have any questions for Kim? Uh, how about the access and education for African women? Uh, so just like, I don't know about African. Um, um, I mean, yeah, in Nigeria. Let's talk for Nigeria. Okay, in Nigeria, access for education, now it's better mm -hmm. for women because. Um, we are seen as you also deserve a chance to go to school because major majority of students who excel so well back home is are, are girls and it's overwhelming because years and years ago no one like you had the so girls in in schools um, do well and essentially because they get parity for education so um, feminist movement is working towards at the moment, like, what would you say girls are? Because I think, like, feminism in the West is different to feminism in the rest of the world, and we, like, we forget that in the West, we think, and we think everyone should follow what we're following, but it's obviously different. Like, what, what do you think feminist movement is trying to achieve in Nigeria? Well, um, I think with the West, you, you've, you've already been um, through the barrier of oh, women are meant to be brought up in a particular way, blah blah blah, but back home it's still sort of that way. So if 
any feminism is going to go on, it has to start with breaking that barrier of um, breaking up women in a certain way and telling them, oh, you have to act this way, and then you have to act that way. And then when they act the way you ask them to act, they're criticized. So I think if anyone in talk should work towards feminism, um, campaign or whatever, it should be towards making that clear distinction that you can tell women to act the way they, they um, to act the way they should, um, and also criticize them for doing what you ask them to. I think um, we were brought up in a way that um, we thought, oh, your role is in the kitchen, you meant to provide for your husband, you meant to take care of the kids, you meant to play, you meant to stay at home and be a good wife and be a good daughter. I think it's total crap. <laughs> you just have to go and pass through that first if you, if you really want to move forward as a country. So, Amara, do you have anything to contribute from the Kenyan experience? In terms of the internet? Not necessarily in terms of the internet, but in terms of anything we've said so far, because we've been focusing on Nigeria. I'm just wondering if it's the same in Kenya or different? I think I can, like, like you just said, in all African countries, like experiences of women are different. But I'd say, like in like in Nairobi, there are a lot of women that are in top positions. In like a lot of, I'm not 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 so much politically, but like in terms of businesses and stuff, there are like women that like won the whole show, and like everyone's really impressed with them. But I think um, politically, like when a woman wants to run and for like a position, it's a lot harder for her because, like she said, it's 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 male dominated, and with like Kenyan politics and everything, it it, it is. It's, it's harder for them, but like I think we are one of the African countries that are that is progressing faster in terms of women's rights and stuff, because like I said, there are women in top positions. So. Awesome. Any final points before we move on to our next speaker? Uh, question. Yeah. Um, do you have any anti-discrimination laws in Nigeria? I'm not sure. Do you have political support for that? Not that I'm aware of, no. Because the fact, forgive me, but the politicians in Africa back home are just focused on power and money and status. They don't really focus on the well-being of the people. And not until we have someone who actually cares about the country and the well-being of people, we do have things like that. I'm pretty sure there is, but no one acts upon it. Upon it. There is an African Charter of Human Rights. I don't know if there is any specific provision in it for um, women's rights, but there is certainly some that is developing slowly in African understanding of human rights and equality. Any final points before our next speaker? No? Without further ado then, please put your hands together for uh, Khadija as a thank you. And we introduce Sharmin, who's going to speak about the Americas and Asia. She can handle two regions. Um, I'm Charlie, as you see, I just want to say thank you to Allah and ISC for like giving us the opportunity as well as Hong Kong to be here. Um, I'll start off with America first. Um, I was told I, we actually had the American first part, so I put something together last night. And the thing I wanted to focus on was intersectionality. It's a really popular word these days that's used, and a lot of people aren't aware of it or where it comes from. So the term was brought forward by an American professor who's African descent called Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. Um, it describes different terms of oppression that can intersect, resulting in many different additional disadvantages. So when we talk about intersectionality and feminism, it's basically when like a black woman can suffer racism as well as sexism, and the same um, thing with a woman that's LGBT or disabled. Um, it's really important to look at intersectionality because I don't like feminism can't like represent all women itself without intersectionality. That's the way I see it because lots of diff women are different. I can't sit here and be like I'm a women's counselor and I represent all women. Like I'd like to do that, but unfortunately I can't because I'm a different person myself. I come from a different culture. I come from a different background, even though I'm born and brought up here. So that was just about intersectionality really briefly. I'm sorry, it's been really short, but that's the only thing I have in America so far. Um, I was told to do Asia, and I kind of like did my research into this. Um, the first thing I thought when I was going to do Asia was like, 
there's one person that popped into my head straight away, and this person, I'm sure, popped into everyone's head, head a lot. She's known as the girl who got shot for going to school. So it's Malala Yousafzai. Um, her journey is very, very interesting, and I've just highlighted the key aspects of it. Um, in 2009, she was like 11 or 12, and she wrote a blog for the BBC detailing her life under the Taliban <laughs> under the Taliban occupation, and um, this led to like obviously angering the Taliban who are all men and they're all oppressing not just children, women, all in that area of Pakistan, and it just led to her getting shot speaking up about it and then this led to her coming to Britain, Britain Birmingham being treated um, and she just became an activist for women's rights and I look up to her so much and I think she's got shot for speaking for saying you know I want education I'm entitled to this despite my gender and um, she just led on going and she's just doing an amazing work campaign for women she's campaigning against um, women um, women that get married at really young ages and mainly education, because I think education is really important. Men tend to get it straight away, but when it comes to women, everyone's like, oh, should she educate? Or should she live the norms that society expects of her? She's had so many awards. She's the youngest person to get the Nobel Peace Prize Award. And um, she's just continually fighting and fighting for women. She's put up so many campaigns. She's opened a Malala fund that helps women. Um, to progress young women and she's had a lot of media attention. She's been saluted by so many um, celebrities including like Gordon Brown, Obama, um, the First Lady of America and it just goes on to tell us that if we can, if we can try, we can get there. Um, that's all I've got for now. Okay, before we open up questions to the floor, I've got a couple of questions for you. And the main thing that I wanted to ask you was about that there have been a lot of grassroots campaigns run by ordinary women who are not necessarily Malala in the um, public eye, particularly in India and Pakistan over the last few years related to rapes. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had any knowledge of those campaigns, any thoughts about them that you wanted to share with us? I do, I have a lot of knowledge on it. Like I was reading something the other day and it was saying um, in women in India, I can't remember the actual like over 20,000 cases of rapes get reported in India every year and um, most of those rapes are committed by family members so like the victim knows who the rapists are and out of those over 20,000 or how many ever it is like hardly any of them get prosecuted and I think it's a great opportunity that like I think it's great it's a great movement in feminism for women's rights whether women define themselves as feminists or not and I think it's even more important that men are speaking up and saying, oh, you know, it's wrong. We shouldn't have to lock our daughters up. We should show up that, we should, like, tell our sons it's wrong. We can't behave like that towards a woman. Because she's a human and, you know, she has those same rights as we do. So, yeah. Any questions from the floor about Americans or Asia? Yes. Um, <coughs> sorry, it's kind of going with what you just said about women being raped in India and Pakistan, but... What do you think, like, how do you think that problem can be tackled? I think, like, from a Western perspective, it's perhaps difficult to, like, look at it and know how to tackle it. Like, from what you've read, what are your opinions about it? From what I've read, um, two years ago I went back to Bangladesh and um, I did a lot of work with, like, young kids, mm -hmm. women mainly, and they all just wanted, oh, we want education. And we have to sometimes we see, like, when like males are offending, most of these males aren't educated themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know what is wrong. Like they think marriage or rape is okay. Well actually it's not because when a woman says no, it means no despite if she's your wife, girlfriend or whatever it is. And I just think it's just educating men mainly and as well as women being able to and fight for their rights. That's what I would say. Um, I'm from India and I think that there's a lot Different countries tackle it in different ways, even though the 
basic problem might be quite similar. So do you know anything about how uh, like different countries tackle it different ways? Especially like maybe um, how maybe women in like Bangladesh and Pakistan and countries like that tackle it differently compared to Indian women. Mm -hmm. I think the way in Bangladesh and Pakistan they're trying to tackle it is um, they're Muslim countries. So they're trying to use like the Muslim law which say that oh you know violence is wrong, we shouldn't like encourage it, it shouldn't happen at all whether it's against a man or a woman, whether it's a husband and a woman. Because I think the thing with India and Pakistan compared to here is it's more within a marriage where it happens because they get married at younger ages and I was actually reading an article the other day as well about approximately five thousand women in Pakistan that pass away because they are victims of domestic violence and they find it harder because it's like marriage thing where the dowry comes in, the way the marriage is arranged and then it's like the family are as well like part of it. So I think the way they're tackling it, they're doing it in different ways. But I think it's within that need to speak up and then we need to support them because we have to realise that like in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan they don't have feminism. There's no word that says feminism. I think we need to introduce that there and I think like the West can help that and I think they are doing that by campaigning. And I think Malala's one of the like the best person because she stood for it and you know she's internationally known but like all these women in these countries that are taking a stand I think it's great and it will take time and I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight and it's sad that it will take time because if it happened overnight it would be really great but yeah it's just going to take a lot of time. Really, really broad. 
She's always um, identified herself as a feminist and as a, an activist for all human rights. And she's always been apologetic about that, so she's always been really um, <coughs> embracing the feminism that she felt was the, really, like, the good um, ideology to pursue and to like, fight, fight for. Her, her activism began in the 70s after she graduated from university and she founded the um, Informant Information Center for Civilization and Abortion, where she was giving advice and like she was providing women with the different information uh, that they might have needed when they were pregnant and if they were considering an abortion or like, keeping, keeping the baby or raising the baby or like if they were victims of rape and domestic violence and all the options that were available to them without making them feel like they were forced into um, keeping the baby and then after that she started campaigning for abortion because abortion is legal in Italy so when she was doing that like all abortions were illegal so like every every single abortion had to be carried out in a clandestine basis so the information that she was giving now about contraception about avoiding pregnancies or about, about like dealing with pregnancies that were unwanted was really welcome and her campaign led to the uh, legalization of abortion uh, a couple of years later, maybe like two years later, so her activism was actually really, really passionate and profound. And after that, she went into activism for the, for branching um, nuclear energy in Italy, and she won a referendum ten years later, in 1986, where the Italian citizens voted against nuclear energy. So nowadays, nuclear energy is not something that we um, we want in Italy. And she was one of the promoters for that particular referendum that she um, was uh, she uh, was nominated the had the Italian delegation for the moratorium against the death, death penalty by the UN and after that she became a diplomat and she started working on the international um, international level. Um, all of her campaigns were mainly about uh, women's rights and civil rights. So she had been fighting for abortion, divorce, um, sexual and religious freedom, um, against capital punishment the legalization of drugs and against, more recently against, uh, female um, genital mutilation and eradication of water hunger. She has won many, many awards for her activism and uh, her engagement in the preservation of human rights, pluralistic democracy and other battles on controversial issues. And she, as the European manager for um, humanitarian aid and emergency aid, she was um, she, she was in that position where in Europe there was a massive situation of turmoil, especially in Yugoslavia, and she witnessed the horror of ethnic cleansing there, and she reported the horror of what she saw, and then she, when she was sent to Rwanda as an envoy by the UN, she witnessed what was happening there, and she took a really powerful stance of condemnation against that. And nowadays, she, um, she's the chief of like this NGO, which is called No Peace Without Justice and campaigns for the implementation of a permanent international criminal court that could count for the accountability and uh, the persecution of all international war criminals. Um, well, what else about that? Um, she's amazing and like a couple of years ago, or two years ago to be, to be precise, she was um, she was the candidate for um, she was not a candidate, but like everyone wanted her to be a candidate for the next um, Minister of the Republic in Italy. However, the, the Minister of the Republic is elected by the government, and in the government, we didn't really have a situation of majority. The government was a coalition and a really unstable one. And when it came to like nominating someone, a lot of the people um, were against her name because of her engagement in the uh, pro choice and LGBT folk. Um, um, civil rights act, um, campaigns and like initiatives, because like most of the people in the parliament even nowadays are Catholics and they endorse really conservative stances when it comes to those particular issues. So regardless of her engagement in all human rights and all um, like all good types of um, moral issues, they still vote against it. Despite most of them are now implicated in sexual scandals, uh, corruption scandals, and they are they are all divorced, so they're really more people. But they felt they felt like they were in the position to like preach against it, to like oppose their candidature. But our president of the republic, our current president of the republic, is uh, resigning in January, and now now the um, the leader of the senate 
uh, Lara Boldrini, who was the UN spokesperson for the High Commission, the High Commission of Refugee, is, has uh, put forward a name again. So probably, hopefully, she will become the next Minister of the Republic in Italy, and that would be amazing. And I'll be, I'll be totally up for that. Um, now, what she does, she, since she's not, and she's not the Minister for Foreign Affairs anymore, is to divide her time between Europe and the Middle East. She's a honorary professor at the American University of Cairo. She's really fluent in Arabic and she um, she she works with um, the different diplomatic agencies and bodies to um, to, to encourage people to um, reach for them to reach democratic solutions in terms of in terms of conflict and to make sure that all war crimes are punished. And she actively campaigns against FGM and wars on rape, and she's trying to raise awareness of, of that in the communities um, with her NGO and with her, with her work as a politician, as a delegate. Um, I, 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 I adore her like, on a personal level. I truly, I truly adore her. I look up to her in my feminism because I feel like she's such an assertive person. She knows what she stands for, and she's really passionate about that. And she's the type of person that talked to Fidel Castro and the popes and told them all for like what they were doing. She told Fidel Castro to raise particular prisoners of, of uh, political prisoners that he had in jail a couple of days before she went to Cuba on her visit because of like their stances and their opposition to the government. And he actually did release them after he talked to her. And then she told the pope that he should stop like the previous pope, not the one that we have right now. But the previous Pope, she talked when she met him and during her visit to the Pope and her meeting with the Pope, she told him off because he was he was constantly repeating in his sermons that women should fulfill their domestic roles and that homosexuality was a type of illness. So she took she took a really powerful stance and she told the Pope off and that was really brave and I absolutely love her. And I just believe that she's amazing because like she is a type of feminist that everyone should uh, identify with the whole movement because she does not campaign just for like women's rights even if she constantly repeats that women are other people who are more suppressed gender wise but she actually looks at the, the other issues that affect the whole the whole population on a global level so I, I i totally adore her and even like her engagement with like human rights in terms of like prisoner rights and homose oh, homosexual people rights um homeless homes rights and just everything that she's done, like transgender people rights, she had an amazing campaign on that. Like I truly look up to her and I think she's an amazing political figure and that um, if I ever get into politics I totally want to like look like her and be like her because she's amazing. <laughs> Any questions from the floor about Serena's love and trust? <laughs> I think Catholicism is growing in a more progressive way and I totally welcome the Pope. I think the reason why this is happening is that the Pope is not from Europe. So for once we have someone who does not come from like a Western country but comes from like a developing country. I mean Argentina is quite it's quite advanced in their in their economy, even if now they're bankrupt. But anyway, as <laughs> it, as as a country, they have seen violence in the last twenty years with like all different words for like power. And then they've seen oppression. They've seen they've seen rape on a massive scale, and they've seen all the worst types of persecution. So I feel like now that 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 like the Pope that we have now. Since he knows what happened, and he was there, and he was actively fighting against what the government in Argentina was doing, um, and even like right now, like the prime minister of Argentina is Christina Kirchner, so he's a woman. Kind of like really helps the way Catholic the Catholicism that he feels is um, a kind of like expressed in by the Vatican in the recent years. You can't really expect the Vatican to be extremely progressive, but like compared to what the last Pope was doing. That's like a massive improvement, I think. Is that affected like this? Um, I think so. I think that has made people more critical and it excommunicated a lot of people who were really morally um, kind of like 
uh, reprehensible. So, for example, there was a priest who once um, posted on this kind of like public wall a manifesto saying that women should stop dressing provocatively and should stop um, um, kind of like instigating men in, in their instincts and then complain that of the violence that was, I think, uh, that just uh, goes against them all the time. And that's because in that same moment in Italy there was a massive campaign by our feminist movement, the leading movement, which does not go under the name of feminism because in Italy feminism is something that's still perceived as hostile to men and the general population. But it goes, within, it goes under the name Serenora Quando, which means if not now, then when. And like fights for like women's empowerment, women's rights, and even like the LGBT board rights and everything like that. But like they had a massive campaign against gender violence because gender violence is extremely high in Italy. In Italy, every single day you hear of someone, like a some woman, who was killed, like was being killed by your husband, or by someone that they know, or like someone who has been who has been stalled and that like um, attacked in a personal way. So like there is such a high ratio, like there is such like a high number of cases of gender violence that that campaign was like kind of like trying to address and like trying to raise awareness of. And that police came up like saying those kind of things, like blaming, blaming it all on the women and everything. And they both excommunicated him. He said, like he openly said, that there was not Christian, there was not Catholic, there was there was going against everything that like Christianity is about. And so he excommunicated the, the priest, and then he took a really um, powerful stance against um, mafia um, bosses and mobsters in general. So like I feel like that this particular pope is a really good pope, and I'm saying that as a non-religious person who was brought up in a really Catholic context, so I think, yeah, we're seeing some improvements on that side. I think we should move on so that we can ensure yeah. that we get through all of our speakers, but thank you very much, Serena. <laughs> our next speaker is the inimitable Anna from the Middle East. And she's going to stand up. Yeah. <laughs> British uh, hybrid. Um, she's based in London. Um, she owns the um, Zaha Hadid Architects firm. She's quite impressive because uh, one of the reasons why she was awarded the Pritzker Architecture Prize, which is considered the Nobel Prize for Architecture in 2004. And she's internationally known for her academic work and she's one of the only women in her field to do so. Um, she's built a lot of impressive archi architecture, including uh, the upcoming project of the World Cup in Qatar in 2022. Um, she had uh, quite a lot of criticisms in her field because a lot of people have this belief that women should not really go into sciences, should not really go into architecture, should not really go into engineering that they should stick to things more they know, which is more of like the arts and the literature. And it's not it's not wrong to do both, really. It's just more of like, this is where her interests sparked, and she's actually developed herself quite well. That um, she's gotten many awards. Um, some, uh, she studied in the architecture at the Architectural Association from 1972 and was awarded the Diploma Prize in 19. Um, she now teaches at uh, one of the universities in Vienna for architecture. And sorry, uh, one of her projects, uh, some of her projects that she's done were at the National Museum of the 21st Century of Arts in Rome, Italy, the BMW Central in Leipzig, Germany, and the Fino Science Center in. Wolfsburg, Germany. 
Um, she's also had some projects that weren't recognized that they were done by her simply because she's a woman. So this is where it comes from that despite all of the hardships she's had, she's quite managed to put her point out there. And now she's known for one of the best architectures, uh, especially since her designs are seen to be very contemporary and very into what a lot of people are looking for nowadays. She's gotten a lot of criticisms about what's happening in Qatar and for the World Cup Stadium, but she did mention that she's not she she is not against the fact that it is wrong to exploit workers like that. But it's also because she she actually made quite a reasonable comparison that a lot of people are dying in Iraq, but she can't do much about them. She can't do much about anything. Then she, of course she's upset about it, but she's done her job and she's provided the design and. Sadly, a lot of people still criticize her simply because of the fact that she's a woman. Another person I'm going to briefly quite talk about is uh, someone I quite got to, like I got the um, opportunity to know at a personal level. Uh, Mayer Maid is a Bahraini woman who initially um, started her bachelor's degree in business management and has a master's degree in banking and finance. But here's the catch: she did not like her job, and because Back home, it's believed that there are only certain jobs that can get you uh, get you a certain funding and like a certain lifestyle. And a lot of people go against studying arts. A lot of people go against studying jobs that think, oh, it's not successful. It has no future. She defied she defied all odds. She started teaching her own makeup class. She, she first of all she started creating a blog, and she got the award for the for social media awards in Bahrain back in two thousand eleven. And then she started teaching makeup classes at her home. And after developing herself for quite a while, she started teaching classes in Dubai as well. And after she got, she developed her career, she quit she quit her job as a she quit her job in the banking sector, and she started creating her own makeup manual studio, which I'll just quickly show you a brief story about. Yeah. Okay. Just made. So she's basically that's the story. Um, what are the lessons that can be learned from this person? Is that you can do whatever you like and you can still be a successful woman in your field. And she is now known as one of the um, like one of the best makeup artists in the country. Um, a lot of people might find this choice a bit odd. Uh, Princess Amira Thuril comes from Saudi Arabia, which a lot of people see as a country that oppresses women, that lacks a lot of uh, lots of women rights, which is quite true. Except Prince, uh, Princess Amira Thuril has defied, defied all odds, and she has worked on herself to, into de into development. She's the co-founder of Prince Away Football Foundation organization, which aims at uh, which aims at helping develop it, developing countries. Um, uh, which helps it aims at helping developing countries. She's also um, put together a program uh, together with Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, she opened the Prince Edward Bhutala Center of Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge, which um, she has also accepted the eight. 100th anniversary medal for outstanding philanthropy. Uh, what really makes Princess Amirato stand out from the rest is that she believes in the power of youth and she believes in encouraging young people to go out and go out go after the ambitions, which is quite frankly what we're here to try to do today. We're not here to dwell on the fact that, okay, um, women are still being oppressed in some countries, but we're here to highlight the achievements that, yes, we can, we can. Can't do that. And just another person, the likes of Princess Anya Thorin is Queen Rania Jordan. A lot of you may know her. Um, she encourages inter interculturalism. Um, she's also provided a, a, an institution for orphans and um, and some quiet relationships with universities worldwide to provide scholarships for students from Jordan. 
and Dr. Hera Sidi, which is also from which is from Saudi Arabia, has um, has uh, been outstanding in her medical research. This again comes to define the fact that okay, women can only be in literature and arts and the that kind of sector. And move to our final speaker and then have joint questions for Ala and Jenny afterwards in order to make sure that we get through everything. So without further ado, I give you over to the incredible Jenny Robinson. I can't find historical writers like inspiring women actually. So I have people I recommend inspiring women and everyone's like, oh you should talk about like the second and you should talk about like Laura Bates, but actually what I wanted to sort of bring to you was kind of an unsung heroine. Um, so I came across a woman called Mary Annie and she was born in Dorset in 1799. Basically like Mary Annie was a massive badass. So she was born at a time in England where like women can't vote, vote women can't hold public office, women can't attend university and she was born to a really poor family in Dorset. Like I think she was one of ten children, only two, only her and one of her brothers actually survived her adulthood. Like that's kind of the level of poverty and deprivation that we're talking about. Her only education was going to school once a week at church where she learned to read and write. Like, that is it. That's her entire education. And yet, Mary Annie was really, really important if we're talking like in the field of paleontology and geology. So, Mary Annie discovered the first correctly identified, I'm going to say it right, ichthyosaur, the first two plesiosaurs, the first two pretosaur, and those are really important fossils. And basically, the skeletons that she discovered were really important in helping to prove the theory of extinction, which was kind of earth-shattering and really big in England at the time for someone that believed in like creationism, and her findings really helped prove that extinction as a theory. And for someone who had like no education whatsoever, she learned everything that she knew about fossils herself. So she didn't just go out and find these dinosaur fossils. Like she knew so much about anatomy, about like, identifying them. She used to dissect like fish species in her spare time so she could understand better the fossils that she was looking at. She borrowed scientific papers from whoever would give them to her and she used to copy them all out by hand so that she could keep them and she used to make notes on them and do drawings and the National Geological Society at the time didn't allow women members and they didn't even allow women to attend meetings. And despite that, Mary Annie became so well known in such circles that like a lot of quite now famous geologists and paleontologists used to go to her house and visit her and ask her opinion and ask her to help them identify things and she used to take them out on walks fossil hunting and like I don't really know much about fossil hunting but apparently this is much more dangerous than I imagined it would be like she came quite close to being crushed under like falling cliffs a lot of times because the places she's digging these fossils out from you know there's a lot of sea erosion um, and cliffs so it's actually quite dangerous and I just have this really awesome image of like Mary Annie striding out in her big Victorian dress to go and dig up dinosaurs <laughs> and tell everyone about them, which I think is cool. And it's kind of a bittersweet story because I think although she came from this really poor background and she taught herself absolutely everything she knew and became an expert, a lot of her work never gets recognised. Um, she solved the fossils that she discovered, so often the discovery of them gets credited to the men who bought them from her. Because a lot of people at that time just simply didn't believe that a woman would have that level of knowledge. So it's kind of bittersweet in that, although I think she was a really inspirational person and she had to fight really hard to learn what she did and she became quite well respected in certain circles at the time. Like historically her contribution gets forgotten a lot simply because she was a woman at the time and her name got rubbed off of scientific papers, essentially. So I thought she was really inspiring. I know a lot of the women who talk about do stuff like that, but specific to women's rights, Mary Annie didn't. But I think it's an inspirational story of someone sort of succeeding against odds, against a society where what she was doing was not the dumb thing for women at the time in a big way. And she managed to do it anyway. But I think there's like a kind of a sad feminist lesson to be learned about like the contribution of women to history and how they get away. Her story. Her story. Okay. Yeah, that's what I really wanted to say about Mary. Does anybody have any lingering questions? For, oh, we have to give to Does anyone have any lingering questions for any of our panelists? Thanks for rejoining us. <laughs> <laughs> Does 
anyone have any inspiring stories that they've come across that they want to share with them? Does anyone think anyone in this room is a particularly inspiring woman? <laughs> I don't know. Well, there are inspiring women everywhere, aren't they? Not just Mary Anning, but right here in this room in Hicks, Fletcher, Bit One. No one has anything else that they want to say. Do you want to talk about Hikashi? Yes. Okay. Has anyone here heard about the Hikashi campaign? Yes. Have you all watched the speech? Uh, we're going to start a bit of a discussion on the Hebrew campaign. Now, um, before we start like the discussion, just like quite briefly, I want to ask any of the other beautiful panelists with me today. Um, if anyone has like a personal story that they faced, it could be like an attack, or it could be um, something that just more of, like more of like a like why do you think like something that has inspired you that okay what is feminism yeah, to you yeah how is feminism to you like any personal story that has happened and has had an impact on that um, starting with Khadija uh, what does feminism matter to you does feminism matter to you it doesn't you can probably <laughs> actually um, quite interestingly uh, Khadija is the ISC chair and seeing as you hold such position in a big committee, have you had any issues being a woman with such position? Like anyone tackling you or any specific kind of? Well, before I arrived in the position, like my people had asked me to work in the position. I think maybe because they had someone else in my life. I had a lot of tutors. <laughs> Anna had a similar experience as the child of Arabsock. Yeah, um, <laughs> do I have to go <laughs> Just say a little bit uh, about that, okay. Uh, <coughs> I was the president of the Arab Society last year, and many people did not like the fact that I was a woman and the president of the society. And others, which I will not mention their names, have tried to put me down in many ways. They've even threatened to have a vote of no confidence just to make me step down as president. Uh, they kept criticizing what I've done. And I wish it was even criticism. It was more of just hatred towards what I've done. They, they, they said, you'll, you're just bringing the society down. You'll never be able to succeed. But the um, moral of the story is um, this: it's kind of this is this is the story that kind of triggered me to have this event today. It's, don't listen to what your haters say. Don't listen to what whoever tries to put you down. You need to always defy against all odds. Because I was actually close to stepping down, and I was actually just reached the point where I was being fed up until um, I decided to stay persistent, um, stay in my position. And thankfully, uh, by the end, uh, it's not the song goes or anything. It's just that, but just serves to show you that by the end of it, we got nominated as the best cultural slash national society of the year, and we actually ended up with the first runner up, which shows that the society as a whole, not just me, has done a great job. And because the majority of the society at the time were also women, so it just shows to you that just because you're a woman, it doesn't mean that you can't big change and you can't be successful. Um, okay. <laughs> what would you like me to say? Just like so far my experience. Well, I just felt yeah. it doesn't matter to you. Well, basically, when I, when I was born, my grandfather didn't show up at the hospital because he was disappointed that I, the first born of the family of his male son, was female. So, yeah. <laughs> so, he, like, he didn't, he didn't come to, us, to the hospital for like three days. Then when he showed up, my grandmother stepped like in front of him. Like you're not seeing her, you're not seeing her. And my mom was so upset that he didn't see me until I turned one, like at the day of my first birthday. He saw me for the first time because like everyone in my family was so upset, but like how backwards and medieval he was being in 1994. And then like my to, to be fair to my grandfather, he was not a very rich man. Like he only had like his primary school qualification and that like all of his 
like he had been treating my grandmother and like his daughters as in peers like my grandfather and like with my grandmother he would he would tell her to like shut up when she had an opinion she would upset about something because she was a woman and, like women are not entitled to having an opinion but thankfully my grandmother she was a really sassy lady and she was older than he was so she, she would go you know like you should respect the elders and then she would take her opinion anyway but that's like that's what like my, my family was about and like he was always that kind of like guy and even my my, my other grandmother on the other hand so she was a massive feminist Massive feminist, and she got involved in the feminist movement. And she was the first taxi dri female taxi driver of my region, so she couldn't stand him at all. And when he did not turn up, she like they had to like keep her kind of calm because otherwise she would have murdered him. But the thing was, that was my grandfather, and then like that was just like tradition and like kind of like the way he was brought up, like the values that he had when he was brought up that like men are more valuable than women. And when he actually realized that I was a pretty smart kid when I was young, then he said like respect me and so when I gained his respect, then like he would treat me equally as my grandfather. And when I actually got like got accepted in in, in uni and here in Sheffield, he cried of joy because I did it and like he was so proud of me. And that shows like you can get respect but like I mean, I didn't know what he did until I was nine. Then my mother opened up once when she was having a rant against him and the way he was belittling her, even when she was just telling him how to freaking sign a contract. But the thing was, yeah, like I gained a lot of like I kind of like gained respect and like I had to because I was a woman. And they kind of struck me when I was nine that he did it to me that like my own grandfather didn't turn off my bed because he was upset that I was female. And that's something that gets you thinking about how society can be um, really back towards you. And even when I was younger in high in, uh, in middle school, and like I stood up for the position of class rep because we had these class reps and they're the people who talk to the teachers and everything. And I thought it would make a good candidate because I was the best student in the class. So you know, I can talk to you because you want, I get good grades anyway. And like I was on, like I was always really nice to people. So I I had like I had consensus and I had my teachers. But then one guy. He tried for the position too and he got elected and that's because like some girls didn't like me and then doing the speeches when we were like t talking like, about what, what what we wanted to do and I said like we have to talk to the principal about some cases of bullying that were happening in the class and were not acceptable then like they called me the little Mussolini so they like they didn't, they didn't even call me bossy they just went straight with the dictator and I was like well fine I'll be the little Mussolini if that's what it takes you know and after that, I always stood up for myself and being the super assertive person I am. But that's, that, that was just really, really annoying. Like the way they talk to you and the way you get perceived. And once I stood up for my friend, then I got called a worthless virgin for that. So there was like quite a lot of sexism. That's ridiculous for like a Western country, for like an area that's economically developed and where people get education. And that got me thinking. That's why I really stand up for myself. And I believe in families and I embrace it. And I'm proud of being a feminist. So. Sorry, that's my third. I come from, I'm, a, I'm the host, but I'm going to speak anyway. <laughs> Feminism is great. Um, I come from quite a religious background, and when I was growing up and I was talking to my friends about lots of my ambitions and the things that I wanted to achieve in my life, lots of them, not all of them, but lots of them said, but don't you want to have a family? Because like that's the number one thing that should be on your mind. <laughs> Forget changing the world. Forget smashing the patriarchy. What's important is that you get pregnant and give birth to a baby. <laughs> and uh, that kind of bothered me. But then the other thing that bothers me is that there are lots of people in my mum and dad's lives at their church who, when my parents are talking about their two incredible daughters, because my daughter's sister is great, and these people will only ask, do they have boyfriends? That's the only question they want to ask. They don't want to say, what are they studying? What are their dreams? What are they hoping to achieve? Where are their lives going? The first question they ask is, do they have boyfriends? And as soon as my mum and dad go, no, they've got more important things to do with their lives, those people don't want to talk to them anymore. And that's why I'm a feminist. <laughs> Charming. Um, what's the question? Why are you a feminist? Oh, well, that's very interesting. <laughs> um, I can give you lots of reasons. Um, I was the first born in my family from my dad's um, brothers and sisters and I was a girl so that was obviously kind of like oh she's a girl she won't be able to do this she won't be able to do that and a lot of women in my family didn't go to university so I'm like the first and I just thought that you know like especially when you're growing up around lots of males and 
you see them achieve and you just see like the women in the kitchen and you just think, oh, you know, something, maybe I want to do what my uncle's doing, I want to do what my dad's doing because they're really successful men and I can do that as well because I'm a woman, what difference does it make? I can conquer the world if I want to. Like, and that just inspires me so much. And then I went to school and it was very racist everywhere I went to school and it's just like, they always told me, oh, you don't be able to do it because you're not white and you're a woman. And it like, kind of encouraged me more and more and more. And I started reading up about feminism and it just got me into it. And um, my family aren't really religious. Myself, I'm not really religious. And um, people always question it as well. Oh, yeah, but you're Muslim, you're this, you're that. You know, you should be believing in this. And I was like, well, I do, so good luck. <laughs> and I get a lot of hatred for it. I get a lot of negativity from it. And I just, I, this is the way I see it. It goes in from one ear, it comes out from the other. Because I know what I'm doing is good. My parents know what I'm doing is good and I hope my friends know what I'm doing is good. And, you know, I kind of went up and to a point when I was like running for um, council elections, I had a man say to me, just step down, you're not going to get elected because A, you're not white, B, you're a woman, it's not going to happen. Well, I won anyway with a lot of votes and I'm there trying to make a change. So, yeah, and I love the Women's Committee and all the other committees in the university because they're all so diverse. So, yeah. Yeah, that's emotional. Oh <laughs> um, well, I've done I was brought up, my family is a very like strong women household. I've got two big sisters and I was raised by a big feminist mum and Rosie there. And both my sisters, yeah, they're older than me and they're both really, they're awesome, they're probably like the coolest people I know. And they're both really great activists as well. So I am quite a bit younger than them. I'm nine years younger than my older sister. So I had a lot of like feminist texts, like in books passed to me when I was quite little, and just thought, I think this would be really good for you. Really good for you. <coughs> um, so I don't know, whenever people are like, why are you a feminist? I'm just like, why, why wouldn't I be? be? Yeah, exactly, that's my only answer to it, really. That's the best answer you can give. Yeah. I actually have a quite interesting question to everyone here, panelists, audience. Uh, I don't know what you're studying, but have any of you been questioned as to why you're studying what you're studying or because you're a woman yeah. and that you have yeah. like you shouldn't be capable because well i in first year i had this guy come up to me and it's like a woman doing information technology how is that possible or like a woman from the gulf is studying at university information technology and or people who have double standards for example like no, don't send your daughter away for university. There's university at home, like it's perfectly fine. Why are you sending her away? Kind of thing. So, um, with the he for she campaign, this is where we're gonna like start. And if anyone has any thoughts or any things for, uh, does anyone want to say a point about the campaign? Just we have actually reached the end of our time. Yes. So, uh, so if no one has anything else to say, we can probably wrap up. Does anyone have anything else you want to say? Can you just quickly go through all your opinions on the new machine campaign? Like, whether you just like yes or no, and you think it's good or not. I think most people roughly know what it is. So we can yeah. do a yes or no. Do we think it's a good idea or not? Yeah. Yes, I do think. It's a good campaign. I always feel slightly frustrated when the focus is on how feminism needs to be more inclusive to men and feminism needs to reach out to men more. But yes, I think it's a good thing. I personally do not feel that that is where the bulk of my feminist energy is directed. My my brand of feminism or the kind of feminism that I do is very much centered about women. But having said that, I think the great thing about feminism and the great thing about activism is that we can all have different priorities. We can all work on different things. So I'd say yes, that the Hebrew campaign is a good thing, although it makes my blood boil. But in Iceland, in response to that, they then organised a conference on women's rights when no women were invited. It was an all-men conference on women's rights. And it's like, that's the message you took from that speech. You really were not paying attention to that. So I think, yes, it's a good campaign. It brings up some other interesting tensions about men and women and feminism for me. But I think, yes, it's I'd say yes, I think it's really good. Um, I'm glad someone's taking a step forward like that. Um, with feminism, people just have this ideology that feminism 
feminism is someone who hates men, who's a person who's like, who literally hates everything that whole society does as a whole, who's most likely going to be a lesbian. And I, it's just, it's horrible that people have those thoughts because feminism isn't about that, it's all about equality and it's very diverse. It's, it's about intersectionality, it's <laughs> inclusive, yeah. Um, you know, there's so many different aspects about feminism. Feminism, because of stuff like feminism, we as women got the right to vote. We have stuff like we tackle lots of different topics in society, such as like LGBT rights, women's rights, um, black rights, and disabled rights. And I think that you should campaign highlights some very interesting things. I mean, whenever we do a campaign, we're always going to get backlash for it, despite what it is. Like, lots of people have bad opinions about it, but, good, but like, you can't always go on the bad stuff. I'm just going to underline what Jen said and leave it at that. Hello. Um, yes, actually, because one of the reasons why I was happy with the He for She campaign is um, as a woman coming from the Gulf, and also a Muslim, I've always I have I was always criticized for the way I dress. And actually I have quite like a lot of Arabs living in my building and then they just don't look at me with respect or just don't talk to me simply because I'm not, because I don't wear the hijab simply but I see the way that I, um, I see that religion is something between you and God and I have a different perspective and I don't have like I feel like I don't have to portray that to others and it really grinds my gears when people just say well maybe she shouldn't have worn that and then that's what attracts a man and then that's what why she got raped which is quite crazy because I think that women should be respected regardless of what they wear because it's their own choice, it's their own freedom, they, they, have, they can do whatever they want to do. And like instead of actually just like telling your girls to behave, I think it's more of a mutual understanding. And I'm not going against guys, this is why I'm for the Eucharist campaign because I've actually seen a lot of guys being criticized, for example, for liking the color pink. For saying like, well, that's a very girly color. Why are you wearing that color? Or like for having emotions. I know a lot of guys who do have a lot of quite, quite a lot of emotions, and that's completely normal because I find that completely human. And I still think that there is still like still some progress to be made with feminism. And I think the Hebrew she campaign is a good way. And I think the way Emma has spoken about it, I think she did actually like speak for a lot of girls who may just be quiet because quite frankly sometimes in your own region you can't really say a lot about it so I think I think yeah I think it's for both actually it's like you, you both need to be respected because I don't think there's a shame in showing that you have emotions I don't think there's shame in showing that you like the color pink and I don't think there's shame in like there a mutual respect between both genders yeah as I say I agree with you and I would just like to say that I really like Big Simon Watson, not because Big Simon Watson, because that would be like a white Western woman middle class that speaks about feminism again, which is quite like a stereotypical view of feminism. But because she's a, she's generally associated with Hermione Granger, and that's really cool because like when you tend, like, when you get that kind of like virgin character that everyone like kind of like learns about when they grow up, because everyone's a massive fan of Harry Potter, I assume, if you're not, there's something wrong with you. But anyway, if, 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 when people see that, and they see like the character, and how she saves Harry's and Ron's eyes so many times, and how she's a strong character, and then they, they see the person that like that has played that character, having like a really strong, um, they take a strong stance in their life. I think it's really beneficial, especially for like younger generations, because they see her, and they look up to her, and be like, you know, yeah, look at that. Yeah, that actually makes sense. And it all comes together. So I really like that so because of that. So, yeah. Do you think the he for she campaign is a good thing? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Should I elaborate or not? That's fine. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. It's been a very fantastic event. Thank you, Ala and the whole of Women's Committee and ISC for organising it. I personally have had a brilliant time being on probably the most diverse panel of women I've seen in an event in Sheffield University in my entire career. It's awesome. Thanks very much. 